years, even before the current ownership of Studio Designer, um, I was able to consult with the original owner and creator of Studio Designer, which was formerly Studio Webwear, and even prior to that, Studio Desktop, okay? For those of you that are super old school. Um, I've been a certified consultant for this company for over a decade. I know their software in and out, best practices, and I'm actually on most of the really early on tutorials, okay? In these next series of videos, I basically give you all the tools that you need to successfully own, operate, and manage your interior design or architect firm, okay? I include step-by-step -step processes for just about everything from setting up a brand new studio designer account, um, the process for project management and what that looks like, and the best practices for accounting and maintaining the books that we've set up. Okay, in this next section, we've already collected the client retainer, so we're ready to start setting up items on the project. Now, typically this is when you are going to be setting up items and requesting uh, quotes from your vendors, but in this case, I already got them. But I will show you the process it takes to uh, send the RFQ from Studio. Um, you click the new blue new item button, okay? And I am going to basically take information off of um, some sample items that I just pulled up and, and saved. Okay, so um, because I have no vendors, I am going to be forced to set up every single vendor. Um, I don't have very many. I, I tried to stay in a relatively small area, which is the foyer. And um, in this case, I will just go ahead and set them up on the fly. Now, I am going to point things out, but I am not going to set up all the, the details for my vendors at this time. Okay, so here you're going to go ahead and select vendor. And you see that there are options for manufacturer, project, showroom, and a bunch of other stuff. Please stick to vendor. The reason why I'm saying that is because client or vendor, those are gonna be information that can be pulled up in different areas. So it is important that you know um, the type of address ID that you're setting up and that it can be pulled up in certain sections, okay? Um, if there's anything that's unclear about that, you can send me a message or I recommend asking your uh, accountant or tax person, okay? Anytime you're in doubt, I always recommend uh, double checking. So in this case, I am going to go ahead and just set up Rove Concepts, okay? Um, a lot of you probably know um, the vendors I will be using. I'm not gonna fill in the ad, uh, addresses and websites and emails and such, but please make a note to do that uh, always when you work because it, it's really difficult for you to go back and then re-add it. It doesn't happen. Okay, we'd like, we'd like to imagine that it does, but it doesn't. Okay, and in through here, you're going to see that there's a different set of defaults. Okay, these are the defaults that will override your company defaults when using specific vendors. Right, so if your markup is normally 35%, which is how I set it up on my company, 35% markup, however, maybe when using specific vendors, I can change that. So then that vendor default will override whatever it is here, okay? So I would put uh, their, their terms here. Um, in this case, I will just go ahead and um, leave it as an open account, okay? And then, the ship via is basically if you if you have defaults. I'm gonna leave them, or actually in, in this case, I will just go ahead and um, put will advise. Okay, if you are going to be paying the order to another vendor or manufacturer or, or anything like that, which is why I said to set everybody up as a vendor in the beginning. Okay, there is rhyme or reason to everything that I teach. Okay, and it is because I do hear all the issues. So. In this case, I'm gonna just leave that alone. I'm not gonna put that. If you had an account number with your vendor, you would add that. You can kind of just see all the different defaults that we have here, okay? So um, in this case, you can see that the purchase deposit is at 0%. I'm gonna go ahead and change it to 
100%. Typically, most vendors will require 100%, especially um, in our industry, unless, um, I know some fabricators may not, okay? So you can adjust accordingly, but um, in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and assume that I'm gonna pay 100%. Um, it makes it all due and payable at once. If you were taking down insurance information, and this is particularly important when you have new construction, okay? New construction is something that you more than likely can't get onto the project unless you have um, your insurance in place, okay? So when you are looking at all of these, if I were setting up a vendor, like a generic vendor, like maybe my landlord, I can make it default to an expense account. However, when I'm talking in terms of vendors that are on our projects, providing goods that would normally be on a project, don't select an expense account because that will be contingent upon the sales code. Okay, unless you're with a specific uh, uh, vendor that will not make anything else but like sconces or anything, I just, I don't recommend uh, putting that unless it is a um, overhead type of vendor. Okay, and if you are confused on what that means, uh, refer to one of the earlier videos. Okay, so this is only to default, and again, it's overridable, but like for things like Office Depot and things like that, vendors that are normally always gonna be the same, maybe like your cell phone uh, vendor, those are things that you can pre-establish. Okay, you still have the ability to change it, but I just don't recommend doing that on project vendors okay. and um, in cases where you're dealing with um, with anybody that you're going to write checks to I always just include them and make them 1099 able again this this doesn't mean they're going to get a 1099 it makes the vendor pull up on the 1099 report okay and as you go through the process, which is also another video. As you go through your 1099 process, we can kind of uh, clean up our, our 1099 list and designation at that time. So for now, I'm gonna say that everybody gets a 1099. I would probably make that kind of a default thing. That's gonna force you to request a W-9, okay? Um, and for vendors like, you know, the big retail stores, you're not gonna need to get that because they are a corporation okay so um, that should be pretty clear you're not going to really use the contacts unless you have specific contacts i know a lot of times um, some of these bigger companies do have uh, representatives sales reps throughout so you may not have the same one um, all the time just depends but you would add their contact information here so that we can select those individuals to receive certain uh, correspondence when dealing with these vendors okay anything else that you want to note or or put in these uh, fields for notes you can do so the history will then just kind of continue to grow uh, as you work within the system okay so now that I've set up the vendor, I can move along. And if I know the ship too, I would enter it here. Um, in this case, I'm gonna leave it because a lot of companies tend to use a third party shipping and receiving. If you are one of the companies that does that, I will explain that um, as we move along through this uh, project process. So um, this area rug that I'm setting up can be uh, classified as accessories it could be floor covering um, it's really contingent upon how your firm is going to uh, classify that I know some people don't like to use floor covering because floor covering kind of to them means that it's something that's intact to the the building or the structure okay and that's not always the case the other uh, alternative would be to call it accessories now accessories that's kind of broad so a lot of things do fall under that realm so I, I try to be a little bit more mindful and I use floor covering if it was me and the reason um, that I, I tell you that these these sales codes matter is that this is going to predetermine how the item is treated as it moves through the system Okay, and that determines whether something is taxable or not not taxable. And in this case, either w accessories or floor covering 
are going to be taxable. So it really doesn't matter. It's more of a preference thing. Okay. This really does matter though, because I've seen a lot of people um, have to go back in when it's time to do sales tax and correct things. And at that point, most often times than not, you're not going to go back and collect additional funds um, from a client. Okay. So make it right. Spend the time that it takes to kind of get these things set up correctly because uh, it's a lot harder to uncover or change things as we move through, okay? You will probably find that the biggest annoyance in studio is the fact that you are not able to delete many things, okay? Um, it's more of a fr frustration for accountants and bookkeepers, but I'm gonna explain why that's so. Um, this, this ability to not delete is a safety measure for the designers, okay? You have to remember that Studio Webware, it's now Studio Designer, was created with the designer in mind, okay? It does not, um, it's not the favorite of all um, CPAs. And really what that, what boils, what determines whether they're um, pro studio or against studio is really um, the ability to come in to your accounting software and just um, have the ability to change things, right? Um, a lot of CPAs and accountants like to go in and be able to manipulate the things to have it read the way they want it to. And that's and that's really the gist of things. Um, Studio does do all of that, um, but most oftentimes not everybody is, is trained or knows where to make those, those changes, okay? Especially with the fact that Studio doesn't allow you to delete things. Um, it also does not allow you to post adjustments to any of the GL accounts associated with cash basis. Okay, if we need to clarify that, I'm going to just read them off to you before I continue. There's only five accounts in Studio that you cannot uh, journal into or out of because of sub-ledgers. Those, those accounts, and I'm just going to rattle them off to you, are accounts payable, accounts receivable, client deposits, vendor deposits, and inventory. Okay, those are the five accounts. That's it. Um, I will drill down and elaborate on that as we move for forward, and um, I will offer additional explanation in the advanced accounting tutorials, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and select the floor covering, and in this case, right now it's kind of stopping every single time because we're having to add these things. After I set it up for the first time, we're not gonna have to keep stopping because it just will pull up every single time. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and set up the foyer that we are working in. And um, you will see that it automatically numbered and assigned a component to my item. Okay, that's really important. I see many uh, firms have issues because they use this weird number here. I, I don't know where they get this string of numbers. Or they just overwrite it and, and remove the, the numbering. Okay, this is so important because if we have a project with hundreds and hundreds of items and I'm sitting here trying to look over the project and we're talking about it, I don't have a point of reference. If, if we have um, an item, like a hundred items in the foyer, I'm going to want to be able to specifically tell you what item I'm referring to. And that is going to be by knowing the room, the item, and the component. This is also how you would find... Um, when there are uh, revisions or changes in vendors, okay? This is, this is something that you want to be mindful of, okay? Because I, I do see people override it. I don't know why they would, but I have seen it most oftentimes than not, okay? And um, moving on to the item setup, continuing uh, in, this, in this item setup still, I like to make the descriptions... Um, have the room, and I will explain why, and I also follow a naming convention for those items, okay? And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like here shortly. So in this case, I am going to just put, um, oh, not living room, let's say foyer area rug, 
okay? It's very generic. I, it, the, the rug that I am creating does have a name. I will ask that you do not make things um, Googleable, if that's, if that's a word. Um, I say that because oftentimes um, people get clients that want to Google things and, and assume that they can find a cheaper um, item, okay? Uh, I pray that you don't have any of those types of clients, but there are people that do that. So um, they don't uh, pay attention to whether the dimensions are off, whether the manufacturer is the same. They just see the name of the rug and they run with it, right? And they, or they, they can find it cheaper on Amazon, okay? Um, my, my response to that is then go ahead, right? Because at the end of the day, they're paying you for a service and to kind of teach them or instruct them where to put these items and which items to put together, okay, these, these, are, these are your fees for doing what you do, okay? So um, I wanna make sure that I was very clear so you can see even though there may be names, if you wanted to elaborate, you can, but I like to keep the description as basic as I possibly can and I'll explain why because Typically, when you go into the client description, that's going to fall right underneath this description. So you don't want to repeat the same thing because you're going to have it read foyer area rug, foyer area rug. Okay, that's kind of redundant. And when using some of the different fields, you're not going to be able to see all that anyways. And um, I do want to touch base on the side mark. Okay, the side mark is what I like to call a file path, okay? It's it's how uh, the shipping companies or the uh, third party receiving, it's how they can identify the contents of certain packages without opening it all up, okay? And uh, what that might look like in this case, um, if we are sending it to our third party shipping and receiving, then I, I would include them in the side mark, but in this case, because I don't have that set up now, I'm not gonna use it. So I will go ahead and just um, use my firm first and I will show you what that looks like. And um, it is uh, my Instagram name, so I will use it. And then I will um, use the client's name or project's name. I include the room and the item number, okay? So if you got a package and again, this, this kind of piggybacks on me explaining the importance of having si uh, item numbers and components is if you didn't have an item number or a component, then the side mark is basically useless, right? Because you're not identifying the contents in the package, okay? That could be anything. So if you have 100 items in the foyer, not having an item number or component is going to basically leave you clueless. Okay, and that's just, that's not gonna work. So please be sure to not override that. And um, I will go ahead and continue um, with setting up the item. Now, typically the item description would go uh, onto both client and vendor. I don't always like to do that. Um, in the client description, I usually won't copy and paste from the vendor website just because again, that makes it Googleable or searchable, okay? Um, I just never want to uh, give anybody's client the opportunity to, um, you know, price match, okay? Just be mindful of that, especially if you're new to our industry. Um, in the vendor section, if you have SKU numbers, item numbers, anything that your vendor needs to identify what it is that you're asking them to create or fabricate, um, you, that's gonna go here as well, okay? And you wanna be mindful of the unit, okay? We do have a bunch of different unit uh, measurements and dimensions, but you can add more if these don't work for you, okay? And in this case, I think the rug is a six by nine, so I'm gonna just, uh, I'll just put each, okay, I might include that six by nine um, uh, dimension here, okay, and uh, the fact that uh, 
if there if there's delays i may go ahead and just let the client know that if if you know that um they are out you know eight weeks i think that's kind of important so you can always note that here anything that's in this client description is going to be visible on the client's proposal and invoice anything that you put in the vendor description is not viewed by the client in any area of studio okay and then when as you scroll down to the from the item setup you're going to get to this area this is the the main piece that uh, i typically deal with being an accountant okay if you had a budget you would set that up here okay and what that means is if i hadn't gone in and already got the vendor quotes if i just had a high low you could do a range we can just we could set this up as a generic item and then as we fill them we would replace the vendor and all the information you know that's usually if a designer just knows that they're going to want an area rug, a bench, a chandelier, like, you know, a certain number of things, and you can just price it out that way. That would allow you to produce a budget. And then from there, as we get information and um, details to replace our generic place card holders, we can do that. And what that would allow you to do is find out how much over or under um, our budget, our established budget that you are. Okay. I'll be honest with you, not everybody uses the, the budgeting. It was it is a little um a little premature to uh budget at that point unless you have a really um really savvy client that maybe has somebody else doing their books. Okay, they they oftentimes will want to budget. Okay, but otherwise, um if you never set up a budget and just started going on here, you're completely fine. Okay, the purchase cost is going to basically be what we pay our vendor for this good or uh, item. Okay, and in this case, um, the item is regularly $1,199. If you are a member, it is $959. Okay, most oftentimes, um, if the price is significant, I will set up... Um, that vendor account or our resale account um, in this case i'm going to price it on the let's, on the um member price okay and you can see that when i did that it automatically populated over in the selling price and that's on the unit cost okay if you look on the next line item, you'll see that it's marked up by 35%. Remember how I said the company-wide defaults are based on, on these defaults. So these, these auto-populate. Now, if we didn't set them up, we would have to manually enter this. Okay, and you can also see that these deposit amounts, uh, they tie to the amounts that you are requesting for the client to pay on proposal. So if you were only wanting 50% for whatever reason, again, I don't recommend that, and I, I don't do that for any of my clients, but you you can if you wish to do so, okay? I, I don't, I ask for 100%, and as you can see, this, this column right here is to, to determine whether this was taxable or not. And what I have seen, um, companies that don't have the defaults pre-established, they may have somebody that's going in here, clicking and kind of setting things up. They may miss this. I've seen it happen. I've seen where one is taxable, one isn't. And like I said, if you have somebody that's a stickler like me, I'm going to sit there and calculate. I'm going to manipulate that and try to calculate your markup. Okay, so just be mindful of that. Again, we don't have to because we uh, pre-established all that in the company-wide setups. Okay, so this is really ready unless we wanted to add shipping and um, I don't I don't have an estimate on shipping but it is a heavy area rug so I would imagine it to be uh, in the couple hundred dollar range and at least right and in here and I maybe I'll let me back up because you didn't get to see that um, in order to get to the other costs other costs are just costs that we would set up again similar to the sales code other costs are costs associated with this purchase, okay? Things that are typically in other costs are crating, freight, installation, and other, 
okay? Um, we can set up additional um, other cost accounts should you need them. But again, I always ask, because typically you're not gonna need any other codes. Um, I've seen like credit card fees and things like that set up, but more than likely you're not gonna pass something like that onto your client, okay? Um, I like to think of it as everything that's associated, whether you pass it along to the client or not, okay? And in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and estimate freight. I'm gonna just say, it, call it 250. I want 100% deposit on that. And when I go and put the 250 on the client side, because again, this is following the the same um, same uh, details as the page before, you're putting the purchase cost and it's gonna tie out to the selling cost um, unit price. And here you have the ability to mark it up. Not everybody marks up freight, but for me, I, I recommend that you do. Okay, you'll find that I recommend that. I'm gonna just share them. You're not entitled to, to do that. I, I'm going to because that just usually covers us. And um, in most cases, regardless of, of um, the state, most oftentimes freight's gonna be taxable anyways. So I just, I, I mark it up. Okay, and I do want 100% on that. Now here you can see that freight is not being taxed. Okay. It should be, okay? And I will um, show you where that default is, okay? It defaulted to no, but I made it yes, because I wanna mark it up, okay? And there you have it. So the breakout of this item is as follows. It's 9.59 for the rug. We pay our vendor. We've marked it up by 35%, and we've put the other cost, which is freight, We've marked that up to 337.50. Okay, for us, we don't usually pay our vendors sales tax. Okay, if you if you find that you are, you need to set up your resale account and make sure that they have your resale information. Now, retailers like Home Depot or uh, Amazon, Wayfair, anything um, like that, uh, Pottery Barn, they don't. Well, actually, I take that back for Pottery Barn. Um, those bigger retails aren't gonna care whether we have a resale license or not. So um, in the cases where you do pay your vendor sales tax, please be sure to enter it here. That's so important because um, you, wanna, you want to be able to process your sales tax correctly. Okay, and I do see people try to tweak this. Um, they will say, okay, if I paid my sales tax to my vendor, then I shouldn't charge my client for that. That is incorrect. Okay, I wanna make sure that I'm very clear, that is not correct. Sales tax is the responsibility of the end user. Okay, I will dive into that in the sales tax video. But for now, I just wanna make sure that you are always charging your client the applicable sales tax for their tax location for the item, and that you are indicating whether or not you paid the vendor for sales tax. Okay, that's the only way that we're gonna capture that. Okay, and then now I'm gonna go ahead and save and close and it takes us back out to this main area. Here you can clearly see the unit price and you can see that it no longer shows at 959 from the outside, okay? But you can see the breakdown of everything. So the last um, thing I, that I wanna do from this screen, actually there's a couple things, but is I wanna go ahead and put the image of the item here, okay? And um, I'm gonna just call it Jones. Um, Okay, that's my client. And you'll find that even though I capitalized the letters, it always puts them in lowercase. If that irks you, that's gonna be a problem. But I know a lot of interior designers don't like to see it in um, small letters. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and locate my uh, image that I wanna use for this area rug and just put it onto the item. Okay, and then... Um, show you what that looks like thereafter. Um, okay, so I went ahead and put the area rug uh, image onto the file. You can see that it's there. And what I am gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and do the final step. If I wanted to propose this to the client, I would just click this and create proposal, 
which I will do. But before I do that, I do want to show you what it would look like if we were going to send the request for quote. If for some reason I didn't have all this down, um, you can send the quote to the vendor. You can't send it from here because I didn't set up their email address or any information, but you can clearly see that this is a request for quote. So they would have all the details and information. Um, that little verbiage that we put in um, at setup is right there. Okay, this is basically what that looks like. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back and in this case, I am going to create the proposal. So I select the item and click create proposal. Okay, it's super easy, but in here, I am going to name it and I'm gonna show you why. Oops. Okay, and the reason why I like to name things, and I also will not uh, put a bunch of items on one proposal. I'll tell you why uh, as we move forward, but it's, it's basically easier to track, okay? It has the proposal. Um, I will now show you that if you go back in and look at the history, you can kind of scroll down and see everything that we've done. Um, you can see the dates and times. So, um, you know, that's there. I, I like to refer to it because everybody swears that they didn't revise the item. So that's why I'm so, so uh, adamant about logins as well, okay, because logins are what dictate your permissions in here. So um, that's that. So we're on to the next item. Now that I've continued setting up additional items in the foyer, I do want to bring up uh, how to clone an item. Okay, this is very specific, but I did want to include it in this beginning tutorial because I think that it's important to know how to do it. It's time saving. Um, however, you want to make certain that you are not going to remove the image. Okay, if you were going to clone an item over and over, um, you want to do so before it has an image unless it is the exact same um, fabric or, or item. Okay, because if you take the image off and try to replace it with something else, it will, it will remove the image on the original item as well. It, it doesn't recognize it. So what I'm going to do is in the case where our foyer custom upholstered bench fabric is the same as the pillow fabric that I'm going to use down here, I'm going to go ahead and just clone it. So how I would do that is I would go in like I'm going to edit the item. Okay, and down below, you'll see that there is a clone button right here. Okay, and I want you to watch the screen when I do that um, because this is the piece that people sometimes miss. And if you do miss it, sometimes uh, it's hard to find the item, okay, unless you're specifically searching for it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click clone. Okay, and you'll see that this just popped up, but usually that's the only notification and sometimes people miss it like I just did now. And what happens is they continue on thinking that they didn't clone it. They might clone it two, three, four, maybe a hundred more times, um, but that's what happens, okay? So because this is the clone, I usually, like I wanna name it, so I will do something like this and I'll call it a clone so I can find it, okay? So save and close and so you can kind of look for it here. You'll see that this one is the clone because it's labeled as such. And the way that you can tell is because I created proposal numbers on all the others, but you'll see that that one is just the clone of this one. So it usually follows the item numbering. And if you didn't have item numbers, like some of you don't, um, you can see how it would be close to impossible with a full, um, database and every a bunch of projects going on that this would be a little hard to find okay and then sometimes when we pull a project worksheet if i were to just filter for schumacher we might find it even with hundreds and hundreds of items in here okay so what i am going to do is i'm going to um renumber it and um how i would do that is right now it's taking the next available number. If I click that, it just basically numbers it for me. Now that may or may not be the number I wanna use, but um, I am going to move this down below so we can find it and use it properly. Okay, so I'm gonna save and close. 
Okay, so now you'll see that it basically moved and you can see that all these items are numbered um, based on these uh, item numbers and components, okay? And I do wanna show you what numbering the components and what first component looks like. I'll do that as we go along, but I wanna kinda scroll down so you can see that all these items are numbered, okay? Now, in the event that I don't have an image, I do like to still use um, these generic renderings. You can find them online um, in Google or somewhere um, online to kind of get yourself a generic stock photo. I pulled all of mine from Shutterstock. Okay, I do have a subscription there, so if that's an option for you, you can certainly do that. If not, um, you can fill that with whatever it is you want to fill it with. But I like to have an image with everything. I just think it looks clean, it looks professional. And um, if I wanted to go ahead and put the pillow fabric onto this, I could do that as well. 